Thanks, Ez. Uh, morning, everybody. It's so good to be together as a church family. And actually, before we get into the preach, I would love us this morning just to turn and to greet one another and say hello to someone that you don't know the name of or have forgotten the name of. It might involve getting up from your seat and turning around. If you're not sure what to say, just ask about blackberry picking. Seems to be the, the end thing at the moment, doesn't it? Okay. Right, let's, um, let's crack on. It is so good to be family together, isn't it? And um, actually, we are starting a new series um, this morning, which is called Part of the Family, uh, looking at over the next five weeks, um, at what it means uh, for us to be family together, um, part of Grace Church. And um, in Mark chapter 10, uh, this, this rich young man comes up to Jesus and uh, asks him what he must do to be saved. And Jesus, seeing his heart, challenges some of the idols in his life, which for him are all about money and possessions. And in the aftermath of that conversation, Jesus is chatting with his disciples about some of the dangers that um, money can bring. So he's chatting about idolatry, selfishness, materialism. And then one of the disciples, Peter, who's never one to read the room, is he? He pipes up with this in Mark 10, verse 20. He says, see, we have left everything to follow you. He's wanting a well done Peter, isn't he? And then Jesus in his kindness says, verse 29, truly I say to you, there is no one who's left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. And maybe you spotted it um, as we read. He's talking about the radical call of the gospel, the call to continually place everything that we have and are under the lordship of our kind King Jesus, the true King of all. He's talking of how the Christian life isn't just one of ethics or attendance at a church building or a home group, is it? It's a whole reorientation of our priorities a dying to the world and its ways for the sake of this new resurrection life that we were celebrating in worship that we found. And whilst that might be because the one greater than life itself has revealed himself to us, the one we were made to know and to love, Jesus assumes in this passage here that for some people, there will be some very painful choices in laying down their life to follow Jesus. I've been reading a cracking book recently. Rosaria Butterfield is the author, and it is called The Gospel Comes with a House Key. Wow, what a provocative book. And it tells the story of a former university professor in New York who is in a long-term lesbian relationship and whose entire community was the incredibly supportive LGBT community. And it tells the story of how she came to know Jesus and how then she began to reflect that in her life choices, beginning to live out the gospel in her sexual choices. And then how um, she got married to um, a guy who's um, a pastor. They had kids together and how they now open their home to many people on a regular and frequent basis in what they call radically ordinary hospitality. But of course, for her, that involves some very painful leaving of people and ideas and safe spaces. And actually, in this passage, Jesus is saying, just like her, there will be people amongst us, our family, who have given up things for the gospel that will have brought real pain, even if they were ultimately for our goods and for our honoring of Jesus. Maybe it's dating the unbeliever 
or the years long weekend routine of getting drunk and waking up in someone else's bed the next day. Maybe it's the birth family who refuse to accept your Christian faith or the way you see your action, your sexuality or your gender. Perhaps it's the friends who have excommunicated you because of that we enter and grow and continue in this family of God through life-defining and sometimes painful choices because we know that Jesus is of such great worth and value that we say, let anything that hinders me from knowing him be counted as loss. Maybe you're on the cusp of faith today. Maybe you are facing a big choice in your life today. Let me tell you, Jesus never wastes a decision made to honor him. Not now, not into eternity. And so to help us live the Christian life, not only does God fill us with himself, with his spirit, but he shows us himself by giving us a family to help us. And that's what Jesus is talking about in verse 30. You know, the people, they've left all these things, but there's no one who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands. And the language, of course, there is very relational. So it's not meaning that uh, receiving houses, for instance, isn't talking about property ownership. It's not talking about God making us financially wealthy. It's talking about property access. It's talking about open homes. It's talking about the family of God, living life together celebrating the highs, standing with one another in the lows. He's talking about the new family that we've been given. Now, clearly, none of us are meant to do the Christian life alone, are we? Like to love Jesus is to love what he loves, his body, his bride, the church. You know, how many here know we can't be discipled by the internet, right? We can't always arrive at godly wisdom by ourselves. We need one another. And so whatever our circumstances, maybe you're new here and just getting to know people. Maybe you're an introvert like me and you really prefer time by yourself. Maybe actually you're a bit proud and you don't think that you need any help. Perhaps you struggle with social anxiety or people pleasing, or you've been hurt by church before. Whatever your circumstances, we've been given the family of God, the experience of which is meant to help point us to Jesus. Psalm 68, verse six, he sets the lonely in families. It's beautiful, isn't it? It's not just talking about the socially lonely, but it's talking about us detached from God and his people as we were by our sin, now united to Jesus, part of the family of God, the body of Christ, because of the gospel. Since moving to Nottingham um, at the age of 18, it's been an absolute joy for me to learn from godly examples of men and women um, in this church. People who've taught me how to be a spouse or a parent. People who've taught me how to host or pray or um, do some DIY, although that didn't really help yesterday when I was trying to find some uh, electric meter in a friend's house they just moved into. I opened a white box. It turns out to be the alarm box and set the alarm off and they didn't know the code. So, you know, we're all works in progress. <laughs> Uh, There's been people who've encouraged me, people who've taught me, people who've prayed for me and fed me and people who told me that I need to eat more. People give me fashion advice. People who told me in the early days, JP, you really need to stop wearing so much hair gel. It's true, honestly, I could name person and moment. I've had people who have loved me and challenged me and corrected me. I've been given financial gifts and gifts of time and responsibility. People who've sat with me in hospital. Hey, even as I was preparing this, someone just brought me coffee just because we're family. And what's that done? What's Jesus saying in these verses? He's reassured me 
that God is very good, that he's with me by his spirit, often in and through his people. Guys, we never know the impact that just one small act of kindness done in Jesus' name can make. Now, perhaps it might be wise to give some kind of definition to this church family because I think that the, the starting place would be to say that when, when we're part of the, the family of God, that that assists, not replaces our biological families. I wonder how you felt as we start talking about the notion of church as family. Because sometimes we can hear that and some, sometimes we can rejoice maybe because we've had a bad experience of our biological family or they're not present for us. It's like church is family, great, I've finally got a family. But actually maybe there's other people like, well, I actually really like my biological family. And so I don't want it to kind of replace something that is, is a really good and godly thing for me. Sometimes then people can get unnecessarily militant about biological families. But I think 1 Timothy chapter 5 is really, really interesting. Look what it says here. This is Paul writing to Timothy. And he says, don't rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father. Younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters in all purity. It's family language, isn't it? Honor widows who are truly widows. But if a widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show godliness to their own household and to make some return to their parents, for this is pleasing in the sight of God. And then verse 8, but if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for members of his household, he's denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Wow, ouch. You know, there's, there's plenty that we could say on that passage, but I think one thing it's really, really important to say is that sadly there, there just are examples, aren't there? of families where um, they've been tremendously unhelpful, perhaps even abusive, where people have needed to remove themselves from those families. And I think it's important just to note that that's not the scenario that, um, that is being talked about here in the scriptures. That actually where people have had to flee the, the abuse of a family, actually the church family is, is a place of refuge. And that's sort of worse than an unbeliever if we, if we don't kind of engage well with our families. That's not the scenario that's, that's being talked about here. But what I would love us to see is to look at the way that the existence of church family there, you know, relate to one another as family, doesn't absolve us of responsibility to our biological families. So my parents are in their 60s. They uh, live in Stoke, where I'm from. And um, as they get older, my sister and I will have some level of responsibility to them. And uh, people can take that too far, can't they? And, um, you know, de deprive older parents of independence, um, uh, kind of take things too far that ends. Uh, sometimes people can uh, sort of overtake responsibility there and, and forget other family members that they have responsibility for. But what is clear is that my sister and I don't just hand them over to their church family, which by the grace of God they have, and then just kind of focus here. Actually, what we find when we're talking about biological families and church family is that the church family and the nuclear family need one another. Now, I don't know kind of any, if any parents in the room will identify with this, but I, I find as a parent that this, this kind of cultural guarding of the nuclear family where the door opens kind of only to close relatives at most. That's the way like our culture teaches us to be, to have our homes as castles and not let anyone in. But actually what I find is that that just builds walls around our inadequacies. Now, my wife Emma is, is a wonderful mother, but we are both flawed. We are both limited. We both get tired. I get grumpy sometimes, don't I? Yeah, definitely. I get a bit tunneled visions. Sometimes I get a bit over the top and don't know when to stop the fun when kids need to go to bed tight. All of that. I need help in my parenting. We need help in our parenting. Take my daughter, for instance. I don't know how this has happened to my very own flesh and blood, but she absolutely loves dogs. I don't know what, she is going to get very little engagement from Emma and I on the love of dogs. In fact, if I ever own a pet, I owe this man here, Rick Loosemore, 10 English pounds. We have made a historical agreement that I will never have a pet. In fact, it almost made it into our wedding vows. You know, that is the level we are at. She needs help. If my kids are intrigued by science or engineering or art or 
architecture or gardening, they are not going to find stimulating conversation in me and Emma on those things. We need our church family to help us parent our kids. The kids need to see godly examples in areas where we struggle. And of course, we try our best to, um, for instance, connect with them emotionally. But I'm sure glad of my own youth workers growing up that did that for me. They might be blessed by our strengths and stuck with our inadequacies, but that doesn't have to be the final words because we've got a family in God to help us. And just as we can share what others may not have, be it um, kids or a car or a house or whatever. Over the summer, it's, it's been our, our joy to have um, a, a few short-term lodgers uh, with us, which has been an incredible mutual blessing. And um, they've uh, helped with the kids. They've um, given me stick for going to bed so early. Um, they've laughed at my not knowing what an unrepeatable acronym that I saw on TV meant. And I just asked them what it meant. <laughs> Um, we've cut together, they've been given nicknames, like we've celebrated birthdays, we've cried over hardships. You're like, what? who's helping who in this situation? It's all felt like family because it's nuclear family and church family assisting one another. Now, some of you might have um, come across a guy called Sam Albury. Sam Albury is an excellent man, and um, we saw him pop up in our Body Matters series that we did a couple of uh, months ago as a church. Uh, we actually quoted uh, him and his church quite a bit in our Romans 8 series that we did just before, um, uh, uh, just into the summer. And um, Sam has written a superb and actually very short book called Seven Myths About Singleness. And uh, if you know Sam's story, Sam is a, a same-sex attracted man who is single and thus celibate in obedience to the scriptures. And in the book, he talks about how in Mark chapter 10 that we're looking at today, Jesus touches on one of the most important relational dynamics in church life. That is the mutual appreciation of those single and those married. And I could list a hundred reasons why we need each other. And if you t uh, in the room today are, uh, are single and want a godly perspective on it, I would encourage you to, to read that book. But if you're married and you want to love those in our church family who are single, which is about half, by the way, you can measure it a number of different ways, but it's about half, please, please read this book. There will be some crucial different ways of thinking and experiencing the same set of circumstances that will really help you to understand and appreciate the enormous blessing that single people are in the life of Grace Church and the biblical commendation of a single life. Either way, here's what Sam says about Mark 10 that we're, we're looking at today. So he says, it's easy to read a passage like that, you know, you've left all these things, but given brothers and fathers and et cetera, and think, it's so nice that God does that. He's got that passage in mind. He's also got that Psalm 68 one, sets the lonelies and families. But the fact is, it's actually deeply challenging because we are the mothers, the sisters, the brothers, the sons, the daughters, Jesus is promising. And he references fathers too. The only reason fathers are excluded from that bit, but included in the bit of people left, is the idea is that God is our father and we are united together in his name. But elsewhere in scripture, there's plenty of places where it talks about acting like spiritual fathers in the faith. Paul talks even to the Corinthians. He says, you had many guides, but you didn't have many fathers. Sam goes on, there's a sense in which this promise depends on us to fulfill it. When God draws people to himself, he draws them to one another as well. The people of Jesus Christ are to be family. He's saying this is what verse 30 is talking about, that when people come to faith, this is what Jesus is saying, through the radical call of the gospel, ours are the houses they get to go to. Ours are the places they get to hang out. Ours are the dinner tables that they get fed around. We are the people that they come to to recover from persecution. And if as a family together, we shut our doors or cram our diaries or exclude all but biological family or friends we know really well, as our culture would encourage us to do, that is akin to us saying that we would rather they were elsewhere. I think Romans 12, verse 5, sums it up really well. 
He says, we belong to one another. I love that. We belong, as fam, church family, we belong to one another. We're a supernatural community, radically called, radically living, sharing life together. And of course, if we're family, that means we have loads of permission to have fun together, doesn't it? As we're going to do as we picnic together in, in, uh, in a few moments' time. But who could forget family carols? Uh, I think about 18 months ago, where we were trying to lower in a teddy bear angel, just like they do in the nativity film, from that window up there, which, which does open in spite of what it looks like. And we tried to lower this bear in on this kind of string rope. What we got wrong was that we tied the rope around the neck of the teddy bear. And so just lowered in this bear with a neck around it. And all the kids were, what on earth is going on there? Who could forget Jeremy's rendition in his preach just a few weeks ago of the Mars A Day song from the 1980s? I almost considered asking you to redo it, maybe. It's kind of, kind of off the point. Who could forget Christmas Day, those of you who, who were around, the caricatured picture of Ben that was presented to him as a gift. We're going to show it to you in a moment. But the context of this is that Ben, who leads Grace Church, if, if you're new, had, had been given a prophetic word about being a leader of strength. And so we thought we would have a bit of fun with it. Here's the picture that we got done for Ben. Yeah, there he is. Our church leader, everybody. There we go. He's a wonderful man. I asked his permission to share this. He wasn't overly keen, but he, he, was, he was all right. Don't worry. I'm not doing anything we shouldn't do. Who could forget Tom over here? Tom. This wonderful, wonderful man, Tom and Charlotte, they're a beautiful couple in the church, going down the slip and slide together at Together Weekends with the carers around as well. It was beautiful. I'm going back a couple of years ago, but uh, who could forget the moment where, where one of the staff members, we were just at the end of a time of worship, we were doing some ministry together, was reaching over to, to pray for someone about 20 seconds before they had to then go and do some notices. And just as we ended that time, put their weight onto the back foot and tore the entire innards of their trousers and then had to go onto stage and be like, welcome to Grace Church, everybody. <laughs> You know, having fun as a church family, it means it really is okay to roll your eyes when light of the world is started again. You know, yeah, if you, if you know, you know. It's okay, it's okay to, to smirk and smile when I use an illustration about football or my family again in a preach. It means that we smile when the baby tries to grab the, and eat the mic at dedications. We weep at the beauty of a baptism story as Jesus turns yet another life around. We rejoice in every testimony of God's goodness. We wonder in amazement together as that spirit song is brought that just makes us go, wow. We weep as we realize together the extent of our sin, but the covering of his grace. We lament our losses. Maybe it's change. Maybe it's people. Maybe it's things that we enjoyed that for whatever reason are no more. We're family. Family together. And we may not know one another to the same extent. We might have different roles and different capacity and different gifts and be in different seasons of how we're doing or time of life. But we're not here because of what we can do. We're here because of what's been done, right? Amen. We've been brought together by the glorious atoning work of our Savior, who is the head of the body. Hallelujah. And if that's true... I can't help but wonder from this passage what it means for who is around our dinner tables, for who's on our trips out, for who has keys to our houses or texts us in a crisis, for who it is that we sit with in church or chat to after the meeting. I wonder what it means for people that we get to know who are different from us, age-wise or culturally or class-wise. We are those family members promised. I think Ephesians 2, 19 sums it up really well when it says there are no strangers in the household of God, only fellow citizens. Which points us towards our, our last point that Jesus is talking about here, which is the supernatural and eternal nature of this family. Because actually as we're talking about some of these things, I imagine for large numbers of us in the room, I actually find that quite difficult. 
to kind of put that into practice. And it really is okay to find it hard to um, greet people that we know less well or develop relationships or um, be in a, a room where there's so many people like this that might be anxiety inducing. In those moments, we just have to remember that we are already a supernatural community. We are already doing what we could not do of ourselves. We are already walking miracles. That by fellowshipping with God, we are doing what we could never create. But Jesus, in his kindness, has done. And so we really mustn't leave a message like this, thinking, I just need to go away and do a whole lot more. But instead, to challenge our thinking of who we are together because of what Jesus has done in making us family. And challenge what we think is possible as we pray, knowing that the Lord will do the rest. And we know, of course, that one day, by his grace, we will hear that call of well done, good and faithful servants. And as Jesus alludes to in verse 30, we will go on to enjoy the eternal reward of all those times where we obeyed the gospel call to live radically, to give sacrificially, to deny ourselves for the sake of others, knowing Jesus' words that whatever we do for people in those moments, we also do for him. This is what Jesus died to initiate. This is the fruit of resurrection life. It gets prophesied immediately after, after this passage, actually. The creation of a people, a family of which we are part, a demonstration of his splendor. Amen.